Hey everybody, welcome back to the Reclamation Podcast, where our goal is to help you reclaim good practices for faith and life. I'm your host, Tony Miltenberger, and I'm excited to bring you a conversation today with worship leader who shares his vulnerable story. His name is Scott Box, and he wants you to check out his brand new resource, Heroic Disgrace, so he can share his story about mental illness, about life, about um, hypomania, about trust, and about a lifestyle of worship. Um, so much goodness here. And it's vulnerable, and it's real, and it's everything that we need in such a time as this. Hey, as a reminder, uh, the Reclamation Podcast is part of the Spirit and Truth Podcast Network. To get connected to Spirit and Truth, check out their website, spiritandtruth.life. So many great podcasts there. And if you want more dialogue, go to the Spirit and Truth Living the Faith Facebook group, where you can dialogue with uh, like-minded people like you, like me, and We'll jump in there from time to time. It's a great place to go after the show to just ask questions, talk, do all the things. You can also hook up with me on Instagram at TWMilt. And as a reminder, the best compliment you can give us, share this episode with one friend, one friend who might need to hear a message about hope in the midst of pain. As always, guys, I'm incredibly thankful for you, and I can't wait for you to jump into this conversation with Scott Box. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm excited today to have uh, with me worship leader, author, and speaker, Scott Box. Scott, thank you so much uh, for sharing your story today and be willing to come on the podcast. Yeah, you bet, Tony. It's my pleasure. And yeah, man, thanks for thanks for having me on. Well, I, I, I want to jump into your story a little bit, but I thought maybe it'd be wise to start from a macro perspective. Yeah. Um, I'm curious You've done a lot of different things. You're doing some different things now. How would you describe the call that God has placed on your life? Hmm. A lot of it is connected to what I've I've just written about in my book. I, but I I know I'm a worship leader. Uh, hmm. So so, but but also I know I'm not a worship leader in the traditional sense. I, I've actually come off of platform, uh, Tony, in the last couple years, and I did it in order to figure out what the heck <laughs> real worship <laughs> is. I, I, that's what I was struggling with. Like, what? There's this word in the Christian, you know, in the church that that's that's worship, and I know other uh, cultures use the word too, but um, mm -hmm. but the the Christian culture has this this thing around what worship is. And I, I would see myself as a worship leader, but, but, well, I suppose that's what we're going to discuss a little bit too, al along the lines of some of the mental health stuff that I've struggled with. But yeah, yeah, I would, I, my calling is to be a worship leader. I love it. And I, and I love the fact that it looks different now than it, it ever has. And I'm wondering if you might share a little bit of that story. H how did you get to where you are now in this kind of new understanding of, um, hmm. of, of who you are and, and how God wired you and uh, how that plays <laughs> out in the church? Yeah. A lot of it's connected to my, my health. Uh, I, 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 when I was about 30 years old, so I'm 45 right now. And when I, when I was 30, I received a diagnosis of bipolar two disorder. And mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll just say it right out of the gate. It was a relief to get the diagnosis. Wow. It, it wasn't a death. It didn't feel like a death sentence to me. I, in other words, life was pretty hellish uh, prior to that. And I, I could explain more, but, but I had, I had been experiencing all the symptoms of bipolar disorder uh, and I was unmedicated and I really, I really was questioning my, I was questioning my heroism, uh, which is yeah. interesting because there's an aspect of, of my family. I grew up being raised to be this heroic figure and it's a thing, whatever, <laughs> but it was a thing. And, and I, I was broken. I was, I was broken and I couldn't be that hero. 
Um, and I was also realizing as a Christian man and as a, as a, as a pastor, I was, I was far too sinful. Uh, I was far mm. more sinful than I, I thought I was supposed to be. And I, I just felt there was this sense of because of my mental health and because of all those other things, uh, I, I really felt like I had no moral authority. And, mm. and so my role in the church and my place in the church and my understanding, I was just, everything was up in the air. The only thing I really felt like I could grasp Tony was, uh, was my friendship with Jesus. And frankly, mm. I didn't have one, but I knew wow. that if, if this was, if what I believed was true, then I could have one. And so I went hard after becoming a friend t- with Jesus. I, so I, I don't want to ever I, like trying to put your story kind of together for our listeners um, you're pretty late in life to get a bipolar disorder. Um, is, I is that, is that a, well, I, it, it feels well. a little, yeah, it feels a little, uh, later in life to get a bipolar ah, disorder. Gotcha. Uh, what, what was it like to kind of work in, um, in, in the church, which, I've worked in the church for a long time. And even though the church preaches grace, it's not always very graceful. So uh, what was it like to work in a church, uh, not having a diagnosis and kind of living in that tension of your body doing different things that you really can't explain very well, probably. Well, certainly it was hard. And I, you know, some of the aspects too, of, of what I was, was dealing with, um, were connected to, you know, areas of, of shameful things like pornography use. I mean, stuff like that, that just, that absolutely, uh, like I said, that there, there were some challenges when it, when it came to this sense of moral authority that I, I didn't, I didn't feel like I had it any, anymore. Mm -hmm. And, but, but, I also knew this. I also knew other dudes in the church and, and sure. I, I can't speak to the females. I'm not a female. I don't really know what they struggle with in the church lead in church leadership, but I know dudes do. <laughs> I know <laughs> I, I knew guys were struggling with similar things that, that I was struggling with um, when it came to, you know, lustful thoughts and all of that stuff. But, and, and I will also fall back on Carrie Ann and I, my wife and, and I, I suppose we we weren't stupid, Tony, but I <laughs> I do think that we were we were naive to think that everybody was dealing with the same problems that we were. Uh, they weren't. Uh, they, the other people weren't dealing with. I mean, they, certainly other other people have their own problems, but but right. they weren't dealing with the massive hypomanic highs and then the the gigantic the, the diagnosis did freak some of my, my church friends out. I, I know that for them, they thought it disqualified me, uh, from, from ministry. And I certainly, I certainly didn't feel that way. I, in fact, I felt like I should, of all the places to, uh, to work through this, I, I, I could do it and be a leader and be a model, be a role model in some, in some way. I, I felt that was my responsibility so I didn't feel disqualified. Hmm. Why do you think the church has so much issue with mental illness? When, when did that become such a thing that we never talked about? Hmm. Well, I, I do think that there's aspects of, you know, in some of my study too, you, you think of the, 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 the miraculous things, you know, what was Jesus healing? Was Jesus healing true demonic stuff? Probably. What was he, was he also potentially healing some, some mental health things? Probably. (laughs) Was, was, was he, was he healing physical needs? Absolutely. And was he healing spiritual needs? 100%. So I feel like one of the things, Tony, that we've, we've lost 
in the church is the holistic perspective of mind, body, and spirit. And I don't know where that went off the rails, but it, it has. And, uh, you know, you've got, you've got people who are unhealthy and in church leadership and are, they are physically unfit for church Mm. leadership, if you will. (laughs) You know, if you hold, if you hold me to a mental standard of being mentally unfit, then I look at somebody else who's just, you know, a hundred pounds overweight and say, well, what, what, come on. And so, okay, that breaks down. I get it. But the point is that, that we need to look at this from a holistic standpoint, uh, just like Jesus and the disciples did. Uh, they went out to not just heal the, the soul, but the body and the mind as well. The church should be about that. 100%. Yeah, I, I think one of the dilemmas that we run into is that there's a lot of people who don't know that they're unhealthy uh, or don't see it. You know, uh, I, I would be curious to hear a little bit more about your story and and kind of that moment where you realized this is not normal. And what I'm <laughs> wrestling with here is bigger than everything else. Right. Yeah, the, the, the not normal part. Um, so back to your, your question about, uh, or your, your, your comment on kind of being late in the game, the diagnosis, my, my understanding, you're, you're probably right. I mean, it is on that later side of things. My understanding is that for, for men, especially the it, between ages 25 and 30, uh, is when the, the, um, the bipolar symptoms, um, that's, that's kind of when it amplifies and whether it's stress related, there might be some mm. stress related things involved in that, uh, to which then back to your original question, um, that, that, or to, to this question about kind of when and what were those things, uh, it was in that five year gap roughly for me, 26 to 30, roughly four years where things were amplifying to the, the standpoint where I knew I, I, I did know something was, something was off. Um, uh, I couldn't put my finger on it though. And neither could, neither could my wife and nor could, n- n- nor were our friends. I mean, <sighs> mental disorders are hard for that reason. And so here's the yeah. thing we stumbled into Carrie Ann and I stumbled into counseling. We, we were looking to adopt a child and mm. our, uh, one of the things that you just have to do with counseling or with adopting is you got to see a counselor and see if you're mentally fit to bring a child into your home. And so thankfully we, we got, you know, that box was checked, Tony, but, um, but but along the way, Carrie Ann and I realized, wow, there's there's some value in this Christian counseling thing that we kind of stumbled into. And so why don't we keep doing it? And then over the course of a year of going together, at which we've that's been our thing for 15 years, roughly. We just wow. every counseling session we do, we do together, with the exception of a couple times where I needed to 911 my counselor and be like, <laughs> uh, all hell is breaking loose. I need help right now on Saturday, you know. And that, that, what a blessing to have that in, in yeah. the tool belt. But, um, I things had amplified and amplified and amplified to when God, it seemed just made the opportunity uh, it gave us this opportunity and this this relationship with this woman who has become our counselor who's become you know, not a part of the family but doggone near i mean she she's such an important part of our life and and that's just part of our story so i did i answer your question as far as kind of i, I didn't get to the yeah. specifics what the things were, I suppose, but, uh, I don't know if that's necessary. I, I don't know. Well, I don't, I don't think it's necessary. I, I think that's kind of the, the gist of what I was going for is like, you know, when did you kind of, when did you kind of know that things were a little, you know, you know when did you have your eyes open, so to speak, 
Um, and it sounds like Let, that that counseling moment was pretty right, pretty pivotal. It, let, let me let me throw this in. Hypomania is a drug. I, I okay. So if you've got depression on the bottom end of things, and you've got mania on the high end, there's this be- <laughs> there's this beautiful place right before the top. That's that's glorious, and I call it hypomania land. I mean, there's this there's this place that's just it's epic. The problem is on the way up when you're going through that hypomanic stuff and it's creative as heck. I mean, it's, oh gosh, it's, it's so good. (laughs) There's, there's, there's a problem though, because then those times of irritation start coming uh, where, where things, lights get too bright, sounds get too loud, uh, feelings, uh, clothing just becomes something you can't wear. And I just wished once I got naked, I wished I could just hover off of the floor. Um, these are the bad things that I started to experience. And I didn't, I, that's when I knew, uh, that's when I knew there was a problem. Can can now, now that you're on the other side of this, well, not that, well, now you've got more uh, wisdom around it, more experience. Uh, can you see moments like these coming? Is it, is how you handle it differently now? Have you learned, uh, d- you know, some awareness about you bet um, the hypo hypomania parts? Yeah, there's w- one of the things I talk about in my story is the the fact that I was very much opposed to medication for years of my life. I, heck, I wouldn't even take Advil. You know, I was a baseball player. I'd get the, mm. the I'd get beat up behind the plate. I was a, a catcher and I just grin and bear it. I loved the bruises. I would just, here's my bruise. Let me show you. And, you know, so, stupid macho hero stuff. I, I, again, that was just part of my thing. Um, as it. Okay. So, so remind me what, what, where were we going with that? The about your awareness currently to hypomania and learning to become, uh, you know, kind of, kind of learning to know when it's coming or do you know when it's coming or how does that, how does that kind of work? Yeah. Yeah. So as far as medication, then thank you (laughs) that this idea of it being something that I was adamantly against when I received my diagnosis and once I had a year of trust built up in this counselor and this medical team, because we also had a psychiatric nurse mm. practitioner who was a part of the process. Uh, and the reason uh, a, psychi- uh, a psychiatrist or a psychiatric nurse practitioner is important, Tony, is because they're the ones that, that can provide the, the medication. They're, they're the ones that prescribe. Yeah. Uh, and they'll work in concert with the, the psychologist. Once Libby, our counselor, uh, Elizabeth Hamilton, uh, she's amazing, but we call her Libby. Once Libby said, Scott, look, medication is, is important. Trust us. This will help you manage your life. It will not change it, you will still be Scott Box. <laughs> it's just going to help you. Mm. It's going to lower the lower the highs and raise the lows, and it's going to make your life manageable. Will you trust us? And my response was not hell no. It was yes. It was yes because mm. it would have for years been absolutely not exclamation point in, in caps. But once I realized what life was like on the other side, Tony, uh, once I had experienced that, I didn't want it. I, as much as I wanted to live in hypomania land, I knew what the price was for my wife and our young daughter Mm. at that point in time. And we've since had a son and I was, I was unwilling to go back once I knew. And when they said, Trust us, it will be like a light switch is flipped. You will know when the medications start to work. I believe them. Hmm. 
Well, one of the phrases um, that you use in the book is a lifestyle of his heroic disgrace. Yeah. And I'm curious if you can kind of uh, paint the picture about what that phrase means to you and, and why it's, it's so important now. Mm. The thing that I'm trying to do, and this is, I, I don't, I don't mean to over spiritualize this in any way, but uh, for, for all of us, the intersection, this is what's so amazing for me. Uh, the, the intersection between my journey of, as a, as a pastor, as a Christian leader, and then mm-hmm. somebody who was dealing with mental illness at, at, at a level that it, it changed me. It changed me. It became, I became desperate. I, I became desperate in a way I never realized I was, I was supposed to be or designed to be. That's kind of the miracle mm-hmm. of my bipolar disorder is, is that I realized I was actually, I didn't just need more Jesus than Tony needs more Jesus. You and I were designed to be desperate for Jesus. And there was that mm. moment of realization where I, I recognized that the heroism that Jesus modeled was an upside down type of heroism. In, in, in other words, in the world's eyes, we, we see, we see th- that heroes need to be winners. Well, Jesus went along and it came along and he shows that, that, well, he was like pretty much the biggest loser, <laughs> and, you know, and, and what, what a complete paradigm shift that Jesus shows uh, that what true heroism looks like. And, and mm. in, along those lines, how amazing, how disgraceful how disgraceful it looked for him to, to, to wash his disciples feet, how disgraceful it was Mm. to be nailed to a cross uh, for for my sins. Uh, What a, what a heroic disgrace Jesus was. Oh, Mm. but that is what's so magnificent about it because that's the lifestyle that I see that Jesus has modeled for us, that I've been able to connect the dots to what true worship is. Worship is not just singing in church. It's not 10 a.m. on Sunday morning, you know, that type of thing. Worship is a lifestyle. And that's what heroic disgrace means to me. So I I imagine there's somebody who's listening right now who's like, man, I, I want to have a lifestyle of worship. I'd, uh, I'd prefer not to have a life altering diagnosis in order to get it. Uh, (laughs) uh, How, how do we, how do we uh, usher someone into a lifestyle of worship um, on a, on a random Tuesday? Yeah. We all have pain. This is, this is, this is one of the things that, that I, if I wasn't, if I think God has, has used my bipolar disorder in order to get this message into the world. Uh, but I am the least likely guy to, to, to have this opportunity. I'm, I'm a train wreck when I, when I'm, when I'm talking to people, (laughs) you know, this is, it's a miracle that you and I are even talking right now. The, the joy though of this, you know, on one hand that, that my, my train wreck of a life is that we all have train wrecks of a life (laughs) and on, on a random Tuesday, some listeners listening to this, they have to realize just as I've realized, and just like that Jesus is, is calling us to, to harness our pain, to be a witness, to, to live a lifestyle that, that can, a lifestyle of, a lifestyle that's upside down. And I, I don't know how else to do it other than to try to, to motivate people with, with a different perspective. Uh, and I don't know other than this, I don't feel the pressure anymore to be the one that changes somebody's mind. I trust that the Holy Spirit can do that in a heroic and a disgraceful way, but he can do it through people's pain. 
Hey guys, just pausing this conversation with Scott to remind you that the Spirit and Truth is a ministry. And as a ministry, we're continually looking for financial partners. If you want to become a monthly giver to Spirit and Truth, it goes a long way to support that all that God is doing on this podcast. Go to spiritandtruth.life slash give. Become a monthly partner today. Uh, and we are incredibly thankful for all of our partners and all the people who have already signed up. It's a great way to support the podcast. And it absolutely goes back into the ministry that God is doing through Spirit and Truth. Now, let's finish up this conversation with Scott. So this idea of being uh, being able to convince somebody on a random Tuesday is is one of those things that I suppose I do need to think a lot more about. <laughs> but I do know this. I know that we all we all struggle with with aspects of pain in our lives. It, it doesn't have to be mental. It doesn't have to be bipolar disorder that flips your world upside down. It could be a loss of, a, you know, a friend, a family member. It, it could be loss of a job. It could be whatever it is. There's pain in our lives that, that make us question, make us question things. And Make us make us question our our place in the world and our our even our health. You know, am I doing what's right? And I I will say that I don't I don't put the pressure on myself anymore like I used mm. to. That I have to convince somebody else that they need Jesus. I, I I'll tell my story and then I let the Holy Spirit. I let the the spirit part of the Trinity <laughs> do His work. In, in other people's lives. And it, I'll say this one more thing. I, if I was trying to convince you right now, Tony, uh, that you need to live a lifestyle of heroic disgrace, uh, I, I, I would just, oh man, I would want you to know that regardless of your pain, regardless of where you are in, in your health, I would want you to, to know, like I know, that God makes healthy what he doesn't mm. heal. In, in, in other words, health is always an option, some type of health, even when healing is the most absurd impossibility. Uh, and I would, I would just go hands, hands off then. If you don't believe that that's between you mm. and God. Um, but if you believe that you can now enter into this lifestyle of heroic disgrace that that I'm discussing, this is this kind of cracks the door. In fact, it doesn't just crack the door; it kicks the door in. Do Do you think that um, most of us struggle with the idea of heroic disgrace um, because of the cultural um, kind of connection to heroism? I, I mean, let's be honest; there aren't many you know, incredible movies or books out there about, uh, you know, heroes that lose. So, <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how do we, uh, how do we wrestle with the tension of what the culture says? And obviously, you know, we, we know that Jesus wins in the end, but you still have to get through Friday and Saturday to get to Sunday. You know, how, how do we live in all that? Yeah. <laughs> that you know what comes to mind is there's also not many fat superheroes either are there you <laughs> right. know there's you yeah. know there's not overweight superheroes i was i was thinking about you know mr incredible right mr incredible had, he, uh, he was out of shape for a minute or two in that in those movies and then you know he became a stud again oh man um i i don't have an easy answer mm. for that uh i I know I know that the pursuit and the reflection of Jesus demands that I do something different with my life though. And when when I think of when I think of a lifestyle of heroic disgrace, I I think that I mean I, I, this isn't what I think. This is this is what God tells us, but my the the way in which I approach it is from a worship perspective. And my worship perspective is in this definition of worship that it's, it's really 
three words. I, I use one word twice, but it's pursue Jesus, reflect Jesus. Pursue Jesus, reflect Jesus as a habit that leads to hope. And see, here's the problem. We, wh what we struggle with when we don't live lifestyles of heroic disgrace, we can, our desperation, like we talked about a few minutes ago, our desperation can, the, can lead us to hopelessness. Mm. That's, that's the problem that we live with in our culture is desperation in these times triggers hopelessness. And as opposed to redirecting that desperation uh, to a dependence on Jesus. And that's, that's the fruit of desperation. That's, that's, not, that's not the rot. The rot of desperation is hopelessness. Mm. But the fruit of desperation is directed properly is that pursuit and that reflection of Jesus be out of a deep dependence on him. And heck, maybe maybe I've just got an inside track on that because I'm so freaking broken. I don't know. I I, don't, I can only speak for myself, but I don't think I've got the inside track. I think there's a, a couple millennia <laughs> of people who have kind of gone before you and me and figured this thing out and lived heroic lifestyles of disgrace, heroic <laughs> lifestyles of heroic disgrace. How, how do you discern... Um... So, so a little bit of my story, I wrestle with alcoholism yeah. and I've got a yes. addictive personality. And so w one of the things that I'm always aware of is that I'm, t I'm 24 hours away from ruining my entire life at any given moment. I just kind of as a general framework for me, like, and, and so one of the things that I love to ask people who are open about their struggles is how do you discern God's voice and will in your life versus the voices that exist inside of you? Well, when it comes to things of my appetite, uh, I, I can often, I, 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 it's, it's, if we're talking difference between appetite and God's mm. voice, uh, there, there's often a very distinct difference, uh, that I've been able to, I can recognize when it's me versus when it's God, because my appetites drive me toward uh, things that are not um, holy, uh, that are that that <clears throat> maybe maybe not even that spiritual. Let, let's put it this way. My appetites will drive me in a direction that could trigger uh, my uh, my obsessive or uh, the things that, that are negative, that, that could cause me pain in my relationships, uh, pain and bre breaking me down in my health. Uh, I, I know those things. I don't need God to tell me those <laughs> things, you know, you know, I, I know that if, if, if I had, if, if I was struggling with alcoholism, just as an example, I, I know plenty of people that know they cannot have a single yeah. drink, uh, or they, uh, or, or it's a big problem. Uh, as far as, as I don't know, hmm. man. I, I I do know that the pursuit and the reflection of Jesus requires a day in and day out uh, relationship and desperate dependence on Him. And when you have that, it's way easier <laughs> to identify to identify the voice of the lord if you will you know it's that's on us yeah. though i mean that's it's like god give me your voice t tell me tell me your opinion about this and and you ha and we haven't been hanging out with him we won't know his stinking yeah. voice <laughs> you know that's a big problem that and i could i speak from experience how, how do you remain dependent maybe maybe that's the maybe that's the right question then is is I, you know, I have some friends in Cuba and they're dependent on the Lord all the time, but that's because they also don't have anything to yeah. eat, you know? Um, right. Right. whereas I live a really comfortable life and I'm thankful. Um, yeah. and so my dependence has to be a little bit more intentional. How, how does that work in your life? I've thought about this. I, I felt, I feel very fortunate. I feel very fortunate to be one of those who 
wrestled with this at a young, younger point mm-hmm. in my life. I, it, it's easy as it's easy for us to look at the people who, like you mentioned, you know, are suffering from very real yeah. needs uh, and life and death type of things, uh, and and go, oh well, it, they obviously depend on Jesus. And it's also another example would be, you know, somebody's retired, uh, they're they're going to live, you know, hopefully another 20 years of retirement and they find out they've got Mm. cancer and, you know, oh man, that person, you realize they, they depend on Jesus or, or they don't, but, but often those are the situations that somebody realizes, wow, I need Jesus really bad. Uh, I hit that point when I was 30 years old and way younger than most people in America. And, I feel like that is part of the gift and the blessing that I was able to, to identify the painful thing. And I, I don't, I, I don't know if I'm humble or not. I think, I, I think there's this sense of just like, dear God, take this thing from me because I need you so badly. That's, that's, that, that's coming out of the heart. Uh, So I don't feel like I have to be starving to get to that place or to have a, a a terminal illness to get to that place. I don't think you need that either. Uh, And I don't think your listeners our our audience needs that either. There's just, there's just a a sense of, of submission. Mm. And if we don't get to that place of submission, yeah, we won't get to that place of desperation either. That's really good. Um, as as you have kind of put your story out there, um, and and I would imagine writing a book like this that's so personal and so intimate, it uh, it holds up a mirror to a lot of things. What did you learn about God in the process? I learned, I learned about the heroism hmm. of God in, in a way that I, I love, I love this idea of, of Jesus flipping heroism upside down. And what we know about God, we know because of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I love that we can, I love that we can be heroic as Jesus is heroic without shame. he, because he calls us to be that way. He calls us to love as he loves. He calls us to serve as he serves. Uh, if, if this is what God, the father is like, I'm in, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm I in, I, I want, I want that kind of, I want that kind of God. And uh, that's what, that's what I've learned. And again, I don't have it all figured out, man. I just know that I know that God is so much bigger and is calling me into something so much Mm. greater and all of us into this, this heroic journey. And, and it is heroic. We should not back down from that idea of heroism, but we have to redefine it in the same way that we have to redefine and reframe at things like worship. Uh, Worship is not just singing. That is incomplete. Uh, Worship is a lifestyle of pursuit and reflection of Jesus. I've learned some great things about God. Yeah. Yeah, that's so good. Uh, Okay, I have one more question for you. Um, (laughs) Before I ask it, though, I I know that my listeners are going to want to follow your ministry, learn more about what God is doing in you and through you. Where are all the best places on the interwebs to find all things Scott Box? (laughs) Thank you for asking that question. I appreciate it. I do most of my communication uh, on Facebook at Worship Hero, uh, just at Worship Hero. And you can find the book at heroicdisgrace.com. I am also at worshiphero.com. So good. Out on Twitter, out on Instagram, all that fun stuff. Good, 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 good. We'll link to all that too in the show notes so people can find it. Um, thanks. Tom. Okay. Last question. I always love to ask people. It's an advice question. And, uh, except I get to name the, the day and the time, um, where, where you're going to give yourself a piece of advice. 
And so I want to take you da- back to the um, the day before your bipolar diagnosis. Uh, and if, if you were going to sit down knee to knee with that younger version of Scott and look him in the eyes and, and maybe even hold his hands, uh, what's the one piece of advice you're going to give him? There was a time in my in my journey where I was nearly 300 mm. pounds and I was, I had just had vocal cord surgery. I, there was no guarantee that I was going to be able to, to rehab uh, and, uh, and be able to, to be a worship leader in the way that I thought I was supposed to be a worship leader. I'm sitting at, I had just come out of the therapist office. I just kind of, I'm sweating. I, I mm. rode the elevator and I'm sweating. Basically, I was so out of shape. Everything was just, I was in pain. And I sat down in the car and there was, I had just gotten in a kind of verbal battle with my therapist who I thought was a total jerk. And she ended up being absolutely amazing <laughs> <laughs> because in so many, in so many ways, there's so much to that story, but she wrote two words on a little sheet of paper that I flipped around. I was a little confused at first, but it said takes everything. Mm. She's not a believer. She was not a believer. She just, she told me what it was going to take to get healthy and her, her line, it was two words, takes everything. And I started crying. I'm bawling on my way home. And so there's that. I I would give myself the advice. It takes everything. What the heck does that mean? Well, it means exactly what it says. I will also say this. That triggered this aspect in my life of it can also become too late to get Mm. healthy. If I, if I could, if I could remind myself, if I could tell myself, if I was there, you know, with my hands on the the shoulder, my own shoulders, looking myself in the eye, I would encourage myself that don't even threaten that line of it becoming too late. Uh, There could have been a moment in time where it could have become too late to be able to give everything that I needed to, to get healthy again. It can become too late to get healthy. That's so good, man. Uh, Scott, I, I just appreciate you. I appreciate your story and your vulnerability. And I'm so thankful for your generosity of time today. And I, I can't wait to see what God does through this resource. Thank you so much, Tony. My pleasure. And I, I love speaking with you, man. Thank you. Man, I love Scott's heart. I love the way he talks about pursuing Jesus and reflecting Jesus. I love the way he talked about worship and how we're designed to be desperate for Jesus. And uh, so much here that is important for the church. And, you know, I pray that as each and every one of us go into the local church, we keep this message in mind about mental illness. Uh, I know that I've had to deal with it as a pastor through uh, various connections. And it's real and it's hurtful and it's painful. And trying to figure it out is a difficult, difficult task. So do me a favor, follow Scott on Facebook at Worship Hero and uh, let him know that you heard him here on the Reclamation Podcast. Pick up a copy of his book, Heroic Disgrace. And again, thank you all so much for being a part of this community. It wouldn't be worth it if it weren't for you guys. Finally, guys, remember, if you want to follow Jesus, you must be willing to move.